Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. Somebody say amen. Amen. And I'm, that, this is Chaplain Doug. Chaplain Doug has 14 services in convalescent hospitals. And isn't that wonderful? In the convalescent hospitals, 14 different hospitals that the Rock Church goes in and puts on a service for the people that are in those hospitals. Many of them have nobody to visit them but, ye, but our church. And at and Christmas time, they get no gifts except from you and from me, and our uh, convalescent hospital ministry is there in 14 uh, places throughout the Inland Empire on doing a church service. Thank you, chaplain. We love you so much. You're the best. I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, we remind ourselves as well as making a statement that we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man. We haven't come into the house of God to hear from a woman. We have come into the house of God to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that the Father would have us to be, that the Son paid the price for us to be, and all that you have empowered us to be. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. As you bless us today, Lord, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them, Lord, and and we'll give you the praise, give you the glory. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Church, um, The Way, San Bernardino Temple. We thank you for our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters. Lord, at no time do we see ourselves as better but co-laborers, workers together in your field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory. Welcome in your house that you built by your grace. Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to know that I've really tried to get out of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number 16, and go to the fifth chapter, verse number one, because we've been in the 16th verse for so long. It's like, what a power-packed, unbelievable verse, verse 16 is in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. But anyway, I know that today and next week, there's another message that God's given me. And I just can't seem to get out of it, even though I want to move on. And then the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, if something's good, why do you want to go fast? If if it tastes good, you don't want to just gobble it down. You want to go slow. I don't know if you've ever been at someone's house who really knows how to cook. When you go to someone's house who really knows how to cook, you eat very slow. And you go, mmm, it is so good. I'm looking at Larry and Vanessa, Dr. Vanessa's house, because I ate there once and I ate so slow. And Debbie about slapped my brains out afterwards. <laughs> she was like, oh, it's so mad at me. She said, you were ridiculous about the taste of that food. And I said, and, and I'm saying it because she's not here right now. You need to invite me back. <laughs> And so it is just, <laughs> it is just so good when you go slow and just enjoy. And that's what we're doing with the Word of the Lord. The Word of God is just so good. I'm going to read the verse. I want to amplify something. Then I'll give you the title so you can make notes on this. And then we'll talk about it just for a few moments. Is that all right? It's that simple. Really important as we look at the verse. Here we go in uh, Hebrews 4, chapter, verse number 16. Let us therefore come boldly. Wasn't that a great message? to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. And I highlight the words to help in a time of need. 
in a time of need. Help. We have a Savior, and I love this, that wants to help you in every area. Title of the message is Qualified for Help. I guess the question is whether or not we can ask this to ourselves and ask the people around us, who does God help? Did you know that about 90% of you that are sitting in this room, if I asked you personally the question, who does God help, you would say, everybody. Well, he helps everybody. But that's not true. And you see, if you don't know who God helps, and you think he just helps everybody, and it's not true, then it might be that you're not very confident about who you are so that you can receive the help you need. For an example, God doesn't help those that are unrighteous. God doesn't help those that are ungodly. God's not planning a murder or planning a burglary at this very moment with somebody who's making those kinds of plans. In fact, you could be a Christian and God's not necessarily going to help you. For the Bible says that he resists the proud Resisting the proud is literally contrary to help. He's a, even though you're a Christian, but if you're full of pride, he will resist where you're going with your lifestyle. Yeah. So God does not help everybody. The question is, who does God help? Because if I understand that and I fit into that pattern of who God does help, then I, like you, can receive help from God no confidently because I've got to come boldly, not like a wimp, not like a little spineless worm, but i got to come boldly before the throne of grace, make my petitions known to God. As I do, he's there meeting my needs because I want to be one of those people that God does help. I don't know about you, I need God's help. Girls, men need help. That's why God gave us wives. Let me try that again. Is there any women in here? Men need help. That's why God gave us wives. That's better. And so we need help. I need help, you need help. Who does God help? Who God helps? There's three things I want to share with you this morning that are simple and quick that I think will really, sorry that I'm using the word so much, help you. <laughs> who God helps, number one. God helps those who know who he is. If you know who God is, he'll help you. The problem is you see the word highlighted no. The word highlighted no there is for a reason. You see, there's different levels of understanding and knowledge about who God is. I can know who God is with my intellect, miss God with my heart, and God won't help me. I can know the characteristics and the attributes and the nature of God with my insight, the revelation of my understanding, and miss him with my life, and he won't help me. There are two types of knowledge you'll find in the Bible. There's the head knowledge that leads men to traditions and ceremonial rituals before God that brings most men to a religious relationship with God. Or you'll find, if you will, there's a heart relationship with God that not only is in the heart, but expands to the igniting of your bones. And when there's a flame of God that lives on the inside of you that ignites your bones, here's what I mean about ignites your bones. He becomes your breath. He becomes your life. 
He becomes your purpose. He becomes your feelings. He becomes your destiny. He becomes your passion. He becomes everything. And no matter what anybody else says, you're so connected with him. He's alive on the inside of you. And he has caught your bones on fire. And he's deep down inside. And he makes all the difference in the world because of this relationship that's on the inside. The difference between the first king of Israel, Saul, and David wasn't the fact that they didn't do good things or bad things. David probably did more bad things than Saul ever did. Then what was the reason? Is Saul had a relationship with God, obviously based on tradition and obviously based on the things he should be doing out of his intellect. But here comes David, who's a man after God's own heart. And there's a heart deep down inside. There's a passion on the inside. Let me give you an illustration of that in the natural. I'm married to Deborah, and I, I love her. I knew her before I married her, of course. But then when I married her, I got to know her more. Now we've been married, I don't know how many years, four kids, 12 grandchildren later. I don't just love her. She's in me. I feel for her. When she's happy, I'm happy. When she's down, I'm down. When she's ha filled, I'm filled. When she's alive, I'm alive. Everything. It's a feeling. It's on the inside. She isn't just something there with me. She's become part of me. And for the season that I have her, until she gets her real husband, you know what his name is? Jesus. I'm just the loner on earth. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just the loner on earth until she gets her real husband who loves her a whole lot more than I ever will. But in the meantime, she's on the inside of me. And I can't get away from her. I don't want to get away. I want to feel. I want to breathe. I want to plan. I want to live. All because she's on the inside. When you love God like that, and you know God like that, man, whew, he's there to help you. Is anybody listening to me? The psalmist writes, and his name is David. It's kind of cool. You might want to turn there in Psalms 28, verse number 7. He says these words. He says, Psalms 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength. And my shield, my, listen to all the my's there. The Lord is my strength, my shield, and my heart trusts in him. In other words, this deep, passionate relationship of knowing him brings him to a place that the next words that are underlined, and he says these words, he says, and I am helped. Who does God help? Somebody where God is down on the inside. He's your breath. He's your passion. Let me tell you something. A lot of people stop in knowing God at an intellectual level. Knowing God based on what you can understand, gather, place together accumulative data, and then process in your life. God that created the heavens and the earth holds it all together by the power of his might. Are you going to tell me that it's only based on your intellect? It's got to be based on something that is much greater, much more powerful, the spirit of the Lord that dwells on the inside and brings forth the very passions and heartbeat of who God is on a daily basis. You can't run from it. I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care if a Democrat, I don't care if a Republican, I don't care if a pedestrian is in the White House. I'm here to tell you my God is on the throne and he's got it all together and got it all worked out and it's gonna be okay because he's sending me help. And I need his help. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. And all of us that are in here today, I am challenging you. Where are you? Because you all, and so me too, think we are okay with God. Is there a deeper, passionate place that God wants you to be? I don't know. Only you can answer that. 
I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but I am putting pressure on you. You know, you'll find a good pastor will get in your face. He won't just tickle your ears with talents and giftings. He'll get in your face and say it like it is. So he'll absolutely at times rub you the wrong way. Like a cat. If you rub a cat the wrong way, you know how to get a cat's hair flat? Turn him around. And sometimes we need to turn around. But I want you to know I'm going to challenge you today. What level do you know God? Do you know him just in your head? Do you know him just with your daily thinking once in a while? Or is he on the inside and ignited your bones? If not, hang around. God's got something great for you today. Come on, somebody. We're talking about who God helps, because I don't know, I need help, so do you. Number one, those who know him, and I don't mean just with their head, but with their heart and bones alive. Number two, those who have faith in him. Can I just say this to you? This is so important for all of us. We can know him and not have faith in him. No, come on, think about it. We can know him, but not have faith in him. We can know him on Sunday morning and not have any faith on him when the pressures hit on Monday. When the trials and tribulations come, that we try to work out our problems through a carnal uh, 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 illustration and understanding, and instead of working out the problems with the power of God that's on the inside of us, the ability to believe God to do great and mighty things. And I can know him, but not operate in faith with him. I can even have him on the inside where he's my passion, he's my heartbeat, he's my breath. But yet at the same time, when pressures come against me, instead of him being the answer, there's some other way I'm looking for something else in my life. Instead of him, and then I never operate in the faith that God wants me to operate in. We can all be there, but I want you to know something. When you operate in the faith, it moves God on your behalf and helps you. That's so important for us to see. Isaiah the prophet writes, he's spoken to by God to tell Israel some things. In Isaiah the 41st chapter, you might well turn there with me, it's pretty powerful. Isaiah the 41st chapter. Isaiah 41, we're talking about having faith in God. He helps those that have faith in him, not just who know him, but know him enough to believe in him, know him enough to trust him, knowing enough to cast our cares, knowing him enough to be at peace in every situation. Isaiah 41 starts off at verse number 10 with two words. The two words are, fear not. Whether you know this or not, the opposite of faith is fear. The proof of your faith is rest and peace. Let me say it again. The opposite of faith is fear. When you're frustrated about something and you're uptight about something and you're worried about something and fear is grabbing your heart and you have anxiety about something, you're unable to sleep about it at night or it keeps you awake during the night, guess what? You're not in faith. You can say all you want. You're not in faith because the proof of your faith, the proof of your faith is rest and peace. You know it's settled in Christ Jesus. He starts off with two words, fear not. And he comes along and he says, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Oh, I love that circle. And if you've got your Bible out, I will help you. But I love the part that he's going to strengthen us. And he'll help us. He says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Verse number 11, behold, or look and see, all those who were des descended against you shall be dis ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. 
Can you imagine God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, describing other human beings on the planet as a non-existent thing? That in itself is just shocking. And I started to think about it with God, and I started to talk about it with God. A non-existent being is somebody who doesn't even know that that person ever existed. You know, Manny, millions and even billions of people that have been on this planet that have died and never even got a tombstone. They were buried in some field or they were drug off in some dump pit and they were thrown out and no one ever remembered them. No one ever saw them. Their whole life was meaningless. No one ever knew what they were about. They never had their expressions expressed. They never had their feelings known. They never had their whole fulfilled. They were people that were absolutely non-existent. They died from this planet and no one at all ever remembers them. Most people that come, no one ever remembers them. They are considered non-existent people. But you who know who he is and have faith in who he is, you're not a non-existent people. You are a person whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That your heartbeat and you will go on forever in eternity. And you, by the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of you, will create a world around you by having some power that comes from you, from the Spirit of God that changes a lost and dying world, bringing them into eternity. You have the ability not to create a non-existent world. You have the ability of God on the inside to create and bring forth life to a dying world that will last forever and ever and ever and ever. My goodness sakes alive. As a non-existent thing or one who existed and fulfilled the plan of God Someone says, well, how do I do that? You've got to learn how to come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy my goodness sakes alive, and find grace in a time of need. Amen. With that, you can change the world that you live in, bringing it from a non-existing world to one whose name's written in the Lamb's book of life forever and ever in eternity. That is amazing to me. It goes on to write in verse number 13, for I, the Lord your God, remember we're talking about faith, for I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand. I don't know about you, but I can just, I, I need God to hold my hand. Mm -hmm. I love it when Debbie holds my hand, but I need God to hold my hand. Are you following me? When Debbie holds my hand, that's cool. But when God holds my hand, mm -hmm. any problems I'm getting behind him. Do you know what I'm saying? And listen to this. A sheep without a shepherd is like a person that doesn't have a God that holds his hand. Because a sheep needs a shepherd to protect them. They have no teeth, they have no ability to kick, bite, scratch, no defensive weapons, no offensive weapons. They're just little fluffy things, half brain dead walking around and the only way they're going to make it is hang around the shepherd. The closer you get to the shepherd, the better it is. Yeah. And I need him to hold my hand. Is anybody listening? He says, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. And then he goes on, in verse number 14. <laughs> How many of you realize before I read verse 14, sometimes people get mad at me because I'm just kind of rough and in your face. I like different, you know, I, 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 I am different than most pa pastors. Mo mo most pastors are kind of like little love boat captains and they're nice and, you know, not me, man, I'm in your face. Yeah. I'm, can I just say it? 
Like, I don't mean to offend anybody. I don't want to offend you or your family. Or I don't want to offend anybody online. This is where, you know, thousands of you fall offline all over the world because you don't understand. But can I just say something? If you hang around this church, I'm going to kick your butt into heaven. And that's what a pastor ought to do. You know what I'm saying? Here's the reason why. Because I don't give a flip what you think of me. You understand? I'm too old to care anymore. When I was young, I thought, oh, I'm cool. You know, I got to be accepted, approved, rec you know what I'm talking about. Man, when you get my age, you're happy to get out of bed and put on pants. So I don't really give a flip whether you like me or not. I just want you in with Jesus. So sometimes I say things that are rude. But it shouldn't be rude to you if you understood how God was. You know, God's not some little sissy in the sky. We got his image of God. Well, he'd never say anything to offend anybody. Well, tell it to the people he braided the whip and ran them out of the temple. Come on, man. He's whipping those guys, chasing them out of the temple. Let me tell you something. The Bible says he is angry, but he did not sin. I want you to know something about God. He don't mess with anybody either. In fact, he says it like it is. Verse 14. <laughs> Fear not, you worm, Jacob. <laughs> I read that, I said, oh, thank God. <laughs> Just justified my personality. Thank God you worm, Jacob, children of Israel, by the way. We'll see that in a minute. Thank God you worm, Jacob. You know what a worm is? You spiny little creeping, crawling little dirt through dweller. You little uh, spineless, weak little nothing. Yeah. That's what he just talked about. His people who do not serve him. They are worms. Some of you are worms. And it's time to get it together. Are you following me now? I'm not looking at anybody. I'm just kind of looking across the top of the place. My eyes are not hitting anybody here. Whoa. But it's time to get it on with God. Someone needs to tell you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you says the Lord and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Well, I tell you what, faith in God, God helps. Is anybody listening? Third thing that's kind of neat we're talking about, and I, I, and I think it's so important who God helps. Number one is that he helps those who know him. I mean, really know him on the inside. Number two, that you really have faith in him. But I like number three, those that are his. Can I just say something to you? You cannot say you're his and live some other way. You cannot say you're his and stay the same. Preach it, brother. That is good. I mean, that's good. Say it again. Let me try it again. You cannot say you're his and stay the same. Wait a minute now. Did you, did you get the Pentecostal? I got a little Pentecostal on you. you can, here's what I mean by that. When you get born again, that is a spiritual transformation. Things change. Kingdoms change. Your thinking changes. Your lifestyle changes. Your DNA changes. Your family changes. Your wants are changing. Your desires are changing. Your vision is changing. The future's changing. So somebody comes along and says, I'm his. And keep on living the way you're living. Let me tell you something. Somebody needs to slap you. And I know somebody who may be old. 
And this guy comes up to me the other day. I was at the back door greeting people. Hi, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Guy comes up and says, man, I really love the church. I said, ah, it's a great building, huh? He says, yeah. He says, you know, this is my church. I said, oh, cool, glad. Glad to hear that. He says, listen, listen to what the guy said. If you're in here, I'm talking about you. I'm going to talk about how stupid you are, but I won't point you out. Because I don't remember what you look like anyway. And he, and, and he says this to me. He says, hey, I, uh, I haven't been in this building. I said, this is your church? This is the first time you've been? We've been here nine years in this building. Now, wait a minute. Can I say something to you? You need to get saved. If you don't have enough insight about God, enough passion from number one, inside your bones to want to get into the house of God, enough faith to get out of bed and get going with God, how in the world can you call him his if you're not his, if you don't even get to the plan of God, which is the church once every, I tell you what, thank God for security guards. They, instead of holding him back, they're holding me back. That, they're really there for me. I just wanted to choke that guy and repent later. <laughs> What's that all about once every nine years coming to church? Oh, yes, I got saved here. I don't think you did. <laughs> you following me? No, oh, wait a minute. Let me talk to you just for a moment. Let me get in your face because I love you. I love you enough. I respect you enough. We can have fun. But listen to grandpa. You never had grandpa ever teach you anything in your life spiritually. You never had a grandpa ever teach you anything. Listen to grandpa. You don't have to wait until you're 50 and 60 to figure this out. You can figure this out in your 20s and 30s so that when you're 50s and 60s, you can prosper in your families and lives. So listen to grandpa. There is no way in God's green earth you belong to his until there's a spiritual transformation which says, I'm no longer doing that junk. I'm going to go do what God wants me to do. Now, if I fall back into it, okay. I'll repent and get cleansed by the Word of God and the things of God, but then I'm going on with God. If I stop and fall, I, I'm going to get back up and go. I, if I make a mistake, I'm going to go with God until I don't make the mistake anymore. And that's what's on the inside of somebody who has a real relationship with God. Or you can go to a church that teaches you about greasy grace. You can just do anything you want to do. Mm -hmm. Go get on television, smoke a cigar inside of a jacuzzi. Same kind of greasy grace. But I want you to know something. The day's coming when God's going to mark what you do. And he's going to hold you accountable for who you are and what you say. Let me hear, let me tell you the truth. And we need to know that God will help us in these times. He is our helper. And I want you to know something right now that who we're Really belong. You don't belong to him because you make up your mind. You belong to him because you made up your heart. Yeah. It's about the heart. Exodus, last verse for today, Exodus 19th chapter. Moses is gone, called by God up to the mountain. God's going to speak to him. And he says to Moses, he, verse number three of the 19th chapter, Moses went up to God and the Lord called him to the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I have done to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God will bring you to himself. But then there's a time when he brings you to himself that you respond to him because you love him because he's inside you, because he burns in your bones, because you have a heart for him. Why? Because you have faith in him, and he'll be your helper. Bring you to myself. Now, therefore, because I brought you to myself, therefore, if, the biggest word in the Bible, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then, Notice the capital, notice the highlight of the word then. Then 
You shall be my special treasure to me. Above all the people and all the earth is mine. Can I tell you something? If I choose not to keep his covenant, if I choose not to hear his voice, if I choose to continue doing my own thing, can I ask you a question? Do I still be his treasure? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, my friends. Jesus took, took the spot for you. There's no doubt about that. But yet at the same time, there's a responsibility that each and every one of us have to do. We have to live this out, what we believe in our hearts. We cannot be slothful about it. Three areas that God wants to help you in and will help you. Number one, who God, who God helps is number one and it's important for us to see is that God helps those who know who he is. Number two, God helps those who have their faith in him. And God helps those who are his. And today, wherever you're at in this place, if you're not right with God, you can get right with God before you leave. I want to ask you a question. I want you to respect the moving of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people's lives right now. Right now. I'm going to do this before we receive offerings or anything else. There are those of you that are in here and you've been walking on both sides of the fence even though you say you're a Christian, doggone it, somebody needs to tell you you're not. And you need to get right with God because you've been messing with God. And I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to stop playing church, throwing water all over you and incense and tell you the truth. The day is coming when the eastern sky is going to split and Jesus is coming for you and me. The question is, if you're in that condition that you're in now, will you go or will you stay? You need to stop messing with God. Today, it is your day of salvation. You cannot get to heaven because you're a nice person. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can get to heaven because you're a nice person. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. You cannot get to heaven because you, you say you love God. You're not going to make it. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to get to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian when you were a kid. Someone needs to tell you you're not going to make it. You're not going to get to heaven because you say you celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life and you know who Jesus is. The devil knows who Jesus is and he's not a Christian. You're not going to get to heaven because you joined some church and sang in the choir for 14 years and taught Sunday school. There is only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. No man goes to the Father. Not your way, not my way, not some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there his way. And Jesus said these words in John 3rd chapter, you must be born again. When I use the words born again, everybody turns off in American churches, in fact, around the world, and that's because the media has portrayed born-again people as idiots, radicals, and fanaticals. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you want him and you're passionate for him. You'll let him drop down inside of your heart and become your all in all. I'm talking about you putting your faith in him, and then you become his and become a candidate for his help. And today you're in this place by appointment. God brought you here. And you have a divine appointment with God. The question is whether or not you will answer it. You've been walking on both sides of the fence and it's time to stop. And now today in this safe and friendly place, you can get right with God by giving him all of your heart, by giving him all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be, I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of it. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, 
and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What did he just get through saying? He said, people that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus and you don't want to be in that position. How do you get out of that position and get right with him? You have got to give him all of your heart. You have got to give him all of your life. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. He won't rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He won't talk you out of it it's, or be a manipulator. He's not a conniver to do that. He's not going to hit you in the head and make you do this. It's your call, your choice to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. And in this safe and friendly place today, it is your time to give God all of your heart, all of your life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. And God brought you here today to listen and to hear these words. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? you got to do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang, like that. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus just in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want Jesus as my Lord. I want Jesus as my Savior, and I'll give him all of my heart to prove it. And today I'll see your hand go up because he said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you before my Father. In other words, this is your day. I'll see your hand go up, and then you can put it right back down. I won't embarrass you. But if you are embarrassed, too bad. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you're afraid of what people think. I'm here to tell you today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, in the foyer. You're sitting there. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. Stop it. Stop looking at those people. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm talking to you. Down the corridors, out there at the Love Rock Cafe, in the plaza outside you're hearing me wherever you're at listen to me if you're walking to your car I got speakers going to your car just so you can't get away from me I want you to hear me some God's coming after you right now and today is your day get ready to pop your hand up are you ready here it is I'm counting to three who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God I'm speaking to you if you've never given him all of your heart you know who you are I'm speaking to you if you've never given him all of your life you know who you are I'm speaking to you. Here it is. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Back here. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Thank you. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Thank you. Back over here. 32. Thank you. 33, 34, 35. Thank you. Back over here. 36, 32, 37, 38, 39. Thank you. There's another one back here somewhere. Wave at me. 37, 38. Thank you. If there's 38, where are you? 39. Where are you, 39? Where are you, 40? There's, where's, where's 39? Somebody, where, 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 you're pointing over this way. So, okay, there's another one. I got them in the, in the family room. I don't want to count them twice. There's two more of you need to come to 40. Let's, where are you? You're saying to yourself, you wonder if you should? You should. Anybody else? 38? Thank you, 38. Where are you? There's 40. God bless you. There's 41. Thank you. God bless you. There's out in the foyer. There's four more. There's 41, 45. Anybody else real quick? Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! <laughs> Glory to God. Get right with God. Now look, here's what I want you to do. All 45 of you, once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff, get out of your seat, meet me right here in front. If you're if you, in the foyer, the ushers will let you in. If you're down at Love Rock Cafe, jog up here if you need to, tell an usher, they'll let you in. Wherever you're at, get your stuff. Oh, but here's the deal. No one leaves during this. It's rude for you to leave during the period of the Holy Spirit drawing people totally unethical, 
totally scripturally rude, don't you dare walk out of this place. You stay seated. All 45 are going to come forward right now. The rest of us stay in your seat. But I want you to stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on, hold. I'll live for you. One every breath that I take. And the moment Come on, hold. They're coming, give them a hand as they come. They're coming, give them a hand as they come. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. They're coming. I'll live for you. God good. All of you in front, God bless you. I want you to look to your left. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. I'm promising you. You know how you go to church and you feel like, you know, maybe they're going to do weird stuff? Pastor Dave's the nicest guy in the world. He's simply going to just beat the snot out of you and everything is going to be fine. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free information. The F word around here is free. We're going to give you some free information about what to do next now that you're a Christian. And then you know what Pastor Dave's going to do? He's going to introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll tell you all about that. Could I just request something from you just for a moment? Stop and think about it. So many people get saved at this church. Then they go back to their old church. Can I say this to you? If you had gotten, if God had come while you were at your old church, you'd have died and gone to hell. You got saved in this church. Could it be that God wants you here? Because this is a church where you heard from God, the Holy Spirit moved you, and you got saved. I want to put my application in to be your pastor. I'll pray for you. I'll love you. I'll never cheat you. I'll never take from you. I'll only bless you in every area of your life. So I want you to consider making this your church. If you will, one year, one year of being faithful to the things of God here at The Rock, I promise you the rest of the years of your life, listen to me, will be blessed out of your socks. You'll win your children to the Lord. You'll win your relatives to the Lord. They, they can't even hold it back. It'll change your whole life. Give God one year at the Rock Church, the World Outreach Center, and watch what God can do. Love you guys. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.